June 1981, the first published report of what would ultimately become known as HIV and AIDS appeared in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. At that time, researchers had not yet determined what caused it, and by the time most patients presented with symptoms, they had only months to live. January 27, 2022. The biotech company Moderna announces that first doses have been administered in a clinical trial of experimental HIV vaccine antigens at George Washington University. The HIV vaccine antigens being evaluated as mRNA were originally developed as proteins by William Schiff, a professor at Scripps Research and the executive director of vaccine design at the Neutralizing Antibody Center at International AIDS Vaccine Initiative. After four decades of effort by the global research community, the development of promising experimental HIV vaccines has now finally come true. We have invited Dr. Paula Loso, the chief of the viral pathogenesis section at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, to discuss his research in developing and testing promising HIV vaccines. Thank you for joining us for a new episode of Science Rehashed. I am Mehdi Jorfi. And I'm Layla Siraj, and we're your co-hosts. Welcome to Science Rehash, Dr. Lusso. It's a pleasure to have you here. We like to start our interviews by letting our guests briefly introduce themselves. Good morning. I'm Paolo Lusso, and I'm an Italian doctor and scientist, and now an American citizen, but I grew up in Torino, Italy, where I did my studies and my medical school. Then I became a, a certified specialist uh, in internal medicine and then in infectious diseases. I have a PhD in oncology, so you can see that uh, I've explored many different areas, uh, but my passion is definitely for science and research. And so back in the late 80s, uh, I joined NIH for the first time. I worked uh, uh, right away in the HIV field because at that time I joined the, the laboratory of uh, Robert Gallo, who is the co-discoverer of HIV. And you may imagine in the 80s, the Gallo lab was quite uh, something. <laughs> wow, Dr. Gallo. I know he also developed the first HIV blood test and was the most cited scientist in the world from 1980 to 1990 according to the Institute for Scientific Information. But let's get back to you, Dr. Lusso. I know you returned to Italy after that. I returned to my country. I, I tried my luck. Uh, it was a new institute that was formed in Milan, very prominent, the San Raffaele Institute. And uh, I stayed there for a few years until uh, Dr. Fauci, actually, gave me an opportunity to come back again. Uh, and so my wife and I, my wife is also a scientist and a doctor. Uh, we decided to accept and come back uh, and we've been there ever since uh, um, in Bethesda. That's amazing. You've been involved in the history of HIV since the very beginning. As we know, AIDS is a very complex disease. And although medical treatment exists, it is not curative and lifelong treatment is required. You've spent a long time studying the interaction between HIV and the immune system in order to find a preventative vaccine. Could you tell us a little bit about how you ended up in this research space? The HIV field uh, has seen tremendous uh, progress, especially in the field of therapy. Today we have treatment that works, that is effective, is not that toxic as it was back uh, in the 80s and 90s. And most important, if you get infected uh, today with HIV and you have the opportunity to take this treatment, your life expectancy is essentially the same as one of an uninfected uh, person of the same age. 
which is really an exciting progress. But the treatment is not uh, exportable easily. And there are many obstacles. We can go back to that, uh, to exporting in developing countries. Uh, this treatment, uh, it's not only the cost, but also and especially the medical infrastructure. And therefore, I felt that only a vaccine could really be a solution. Of course, I was not the first <laughs> to think about an HIV vaccine. Uh, there are many groups that have spent years, if not decades, on this. But the story of the HIV vaccine has been full of failures. Then at some point, the mRNA technology came of age, and this was actually way before the COVID pandemic. And uh, I immediately felt that this was uh, uh, an opportunity for HIV, and I can explain you why. We started to consider the idea, we started contacts with Moderna, and uh, in a few months we were on the train and things started to, to happen. And you mentioned that there have been failed attempts to develop an efficient vaccine against HIV. Why it took so long to develop a potential efficient vaccine? If you look at, at the at parallel lives, if you want, of HIV and, and COVID now, COVID, uh, uh, the COVID virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, is a very simple virus. It's a virus that has uh, very few tricks apart from this continuous variation, which is typical of RNA viruses. No RNA is much more prone to variation. And therefore, antigenic variability remains a problem, like flu, like some other viruses. But uh, in its structure, uh, it's not enacting uh, particular tricks to defend itself from the immune system. So once it enters the body, the immune system is able to see some of the weak spots of the targets for virus neutralization, develops antibodies, can be more or less efficient, but they are relatively easy to visualize by the immune system. And that's the reason why we got the vaccine in no time. HIV is a completely different story because HIV is really a master of disguise, a master of transformation. It's a sort of Houdini, if you want, uh, of uh, uh, virology and has developed uh, this incredible armamentarium uh, of, um, of tricks to escape uh, the immune system, to make himself uh, invisible because it really goes under the radar and it's extremely difficult for the immune system to visualize it. And that's why it's so difficult to make a vaccine. Our show is available through Apple Podcast, Spotify, Amazon Music, Stitcher, and Google Podcast. Please subscribe and refer our podcast to your friends. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter, or you can visit our website at sciencerehashed.com. We'd love to hear from you, so please give us your comments and feedback through our website, and let's chat. And get to know our talented multinational team by following us on Instagram at science, no space, rehashed, as we walk through our day-to-day -day tasks in an Instagram takeover and more. Our interests go far beyond science, from illustration to bike riding and much more. As our listeners may know, the immune system is in charge of defending us from pathogens, which we can conceptualize as anything that looks not familiar to our system. The immune system is divided into two groups, the main guard called the innate immune system and the backup guard called the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system includes different types of cells, T cells, which are the chief commanders, antigen presenting cells, which activate the intruder alarm, and B cells, which produce the antibodies to fight the intruder. Now, Dr. Lusso, you just mentioned HIV is pretty good at evading the immune system. I'm curious to know, what are its strategies? Is the presence of sugars on the viral surface helping it to not be spotted by the immune system? Absolutely. That's one of the key uh, stratagems used by the virus, because as you know, sugars are uh, seen by the immune system as self most of the time. 
it's very difficult for the immune system to recognize a good sugar from a bad sugar, an invading sugar, because they look pretty much the same. But it's not the only factor. There's also uh, what we call a conformational camouflage. I explain. Virus envelope is uh, in a form of a trimer. So it's three identical moieties, uh, units of uh, a protomer of the envelope. And uh, they are in a, what we call a metastable conformation. So essentially, it's like a moving uh, object because it's continuously exploring different conformations. And by never being static in one form, it's very difficult for the immune system to take a snapshot that is focused because it's like you try to take a, a picture of an object that moves. It's very difficult for the immune system to visualize that. So uh, it's always a little out of focus, and this is one of the reasons uh, why making antibodies to the right spots, which exist, that's the good news, but it's still very difficult for the immune system. For the non-immunologist among us, can you tell us a little bit more about this envelope protein? The HIV like has uh, uh, several components that assemble together to form this uh, mini robot uh, that you One of the key components uh, is uh, the outer coat uh, uh, protein, which is called the envelope protein, similar to the spike uh, protein that is so famous or infamous for (laughs) COVID-19. But uh, uh, why is it important? Because being outside, it is the protein that interacts with the outside environment, and it's the protein that can be the first target of antibodies that can block uh, infection. Actually, the envelope is usually the protein that interacts with uh, our cells, uh, with the specific proteins that are called receptors on our cells, and uh, allows the virus to uh, get through the door and into the cell. But then there are other components. One of them, very important, is called GAG, And uh, it's, uh, if you want, sort of the skeleton of the virus. In your recent study published last December in Nature Medicine, which is publicly available for all our listeners, you used encapsulated mRNA to encode both the HIV envelope glycoprotein and the protein GAG. These induce the immune system to produce virus-like particles, which would result in the production of antibodies why you decided on these two virus components specifically? Generally, most of the attempts that have been made uh, uh, before to develop a vaccine were based uh, on the envelope protein uh, in isolation because that's the sole target uh, of what we call the the broadly neutralizing antibodies. That's the type of antibodies you would like to induce. But we chose to add also the GAG protein for a very specific reason. In this case, our aim was to mimic nature as much as possible. And how do we do this? By creating some particles that we call virus-like particles, VLPs, that are very, very similar to the actual virus. And this is important because size also counts. So if you present the antigen in isolation, you may uh, lose something. But if you present it in the natural form that uh, resembles uh, the natural virus, we know it's more effective. The uh, cells that process the antigen, antigen presenting cells are more uh, effective and uh, present it better. But again, we try to mimic nature. So we actually used uh, the exact form that uh, is present on the surface of the virus. And that is the full length, the membrane anchored form of envelope. It makes uh, the antigen look like the real particles. Thanks to the COVID pandemic, vaccines are definitely a hot topic these days. So by now, most of our listeners may know that there are different types of vaccines. What made you choose an mRNA platform to develop your vaccine? The fact that we used the uh, mRNA platform for the vaccine gave us a 
really big advantage over the vaccines that uh, have been tested before for one very important reason, and that is that uh, the body itself becomes the factory of the vaccine. And therefore, the proteins are produced exactly as they would be produced in nature. If you produce viral proteins uh, in cell culture in the laboratory or in an industrial setting, you produce something that is similar, but it's not exactly the same. And that's why mRNA has been very useful because it uh, allows for the production of the real thing, the proteins as they should be. And this makes a difference for the immune system to produce the right type of uh, antibodies. So you used mRNA to express proteins that are more likely to produce broadly neutralizing antibodies. Could you elaborate on this process of antibody production and how you went about achieving that goal? The immune system has an enormous potential because, you know, it can recognize almost any antigen. But because these uh, weak spots of HIV are so difficult to reach, you need to educate the immune system through a very long process, starting from the very beginning. And what is the very beginning? It's the recruitment of, of what we call the ancestor B cells. So we have this uh, very broad uh, repertoire or army, if you want, of dormant uh, soldiers. <laughs> and uh, each antigen, when it gets into the body, will uh, be recognized by a, a few of these dormant soldiers, these precursor B cells that uh, are still uh, in a very rough form. They are primitive, if you want. And once they are recruited, they need the education. They need to be refined and uh, brought to high affinity antibody production, which is a very complex process. In the case of HIV, even more complex than for other viruses. So we decided to use a sequential protocol where we started with an envelope that engages these dormant soldiers, the precursors, and then started to drive them toward the more refined form by using the same uh, type of envelope, but in a more closed form that was more difficult to recognize. And then we uh, moved to a series of booster injections with uh, a combination of very different forms of the virus from other genetic uh, clades, So in this uh, sequential uh, process, we believe that we actually recruited and gave a full education to our B cells to produce the right antibodies. That was a great explanation, Dr. Loso. It seems that our B cells have to go to school and get degrees to be capable of efficiently defending us from intruders. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, antibodies... uh, can get to a very high level of sophistication and recognize very precisely a specific form of an antigen that is unique. How does this happen? I always think of uh, when you go duplicate a key, you have your your master key that is blunt, it doesn't have a shape, but it has the right uh, shape uh, to enter into your uh, lock. So why is it then so complicated to make the right key for the HIV lock? In the case of HIV, because of all of this uh, trickery that HIV enacts, there's some added uh, complications. And one of the complications is that uh, you have to go through that famous uh, sugar coating. So you need antibodies that have particularly long uh, projections uh, at the end. It's like a key that has an extra piece uh, at the end to reach even uh, deeper into the lock. And this is rare. Uh, Our uh, immune repertoire doesn't do this very often, but the beauty is that it can do it. 
the problem is you need education of your B cells and a very long process. These long arms make me think of the Inspector Gadget cartoon, really. <laughs> so if B cells graduate successfully, then they will have the right weapons to fight HIV. But how do we know this? Because some people who are infected actually develop the right antibodies at some point during their infection. But it takes months, if not years, many times. So this means that uh, this process of education has to go through a series of steps. That's what we were trying to mimic with our vaccine. Hi, listeners. I hope you are enjoying our episodes. If you want to tell us your thoughts, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review to let us know what you think about Science Rehashed. Listeners, if you also want to ask questions during our next episodes, don't forget to post them on Twitter at Science Rehashed on one of our next interview tweets. Dr. Loso, how you really characterize the success of these B cells and the production of the right number and type of antibodies? Well, we have uh, a number of, uh, of ways uh, to really perform a complete f- uh, fingerprinting, if you want, uh, of our antibody responses. And uh, that has been possible by uh, a lot of uh, advances in the field, uh, especially the production of uh, um, synthetic forms uh, of the envelope that adopt uh, the right conformation by and large, and uh, they are in a near native conformation. This was uh, work uh, um, at the beginning of the 2010s that really moved the field forward uh, very strongly. And uh, after that, there has been a a cloning and characterization of uh, many of these broadly neutralizing antibodies directly from the body of infected people. As I was saying, some people develop the right antibodies. For them, it's too late, unfortunately, because they are already chronically infected. The virus is hiding everywhere in the body. So it's very difficult for these antibodies to really clear the infection and clean up and uh, heal the person. These uh, antibodies have been very, very precious in the field because they teach us where are the weak spots, what we need to target. And uh, nowadays we have a a battery of um, 20, 30 different antibodies that target uh, these weak spots around the envelope, and and we know very precisely at the atomic level, there have been many, many beautiful uh, studies done by crystallography and more recently cryo-EM. We can see at the atomic level really how these antibodies bind to the uh, outer coat uh, and precisely what uh, region is uh, forming these weak spots. In your model, you use chimps to inject the vaccines. How did you trace the right antibodies in them? In our monkeys, we can try to map where these antibodies are binding and if they bind the same region that some of the broadly neutralizing antibodies that have been cloned are binding. And then we have uh, methods uh, to uh, more blindly, if you want, uh, verify if these antibodies can neutralize the virus. And most important, if they neutralize with a broad spectrum. That's the key for HIV because like other RNA viruses like COVID, like hepatitis C, there are many different variants that circulate in the world for HIV probably uh, even more than for any other virus. Consider that even within your own body, if you are infected, there are many different micro variants that circulate. So the variation is really endless. And therefore you test in the lab if your antibodies, if the serum of your macaques, for example, in this case, can inhibit, neutralize 
not only one strain, not only the strain you use for the vaccine, but also strain A, B, C, D, E. We have uh, an, a, a very big inventory in, in the lab of strains that come from all over the world. And the beauty in our case is that uh, we have this mini global panel of 12 strains representative of all different parts of the world. It's like a mini United Nations uh, of HIV. And uh, we tested that and our monkeys were able to block 11 out of 12 of these global different strains, which uh, was really remarkable. No other vaccine had do has done this before. That's incredible. And we know that in order to get the right titers of antibodies, the number of doses to be administered can vary. The monkeys that we used received seven boosters or even more. And uh, only after the sixth boost, uh, we actually started to see the right type of antibodies. So the education process really takes a long time until they're ready to tackle the, the big leagues of HIV infection. Yeah. And you've seen this with, even with COVID, as I say, is a, a simpler, much simpler virus. The third boost was really essential to induce uh, the breadth of uh, response that we needed. For HIV, we decided uh, to use these sequential boosters because we already knew that the process uh, is very long and, and challenging. And we were monitoring, of course, uh, the macaques uh, at every step to see if we were starting to see the right type of antibodies. But uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, it took uh, six injections before seeing the first signs of a broadening uh, immune response. Dr. Loso, can we speak about the safety of this vaccine? In terms of safety, I'm very optimistic, and i tell you why. First, because our monkeys were actually doing very well, despite getting a very high dose of mRNA. We know for HIV we need a high dose because the envelope is not very immunogenic, much less than the COVID spike. So probably the dose will be higher than the original COVID vaccine. But uh, in the animals, uh, we didn't observe uh, anything uh, special and it, it didn't uh, complain uh, too much. They, they lost appetite maybe for a couple of days, uh, a few of them, but nothing uh, uh, major. And this is probably due to the fact that uh, the uh, HIV protein is not particularly bad. The COVID spike is probably the reason why we get all these side effects from the COVID vaccine, not uh, mRNA itself. Now that you showed it's safe and it may work, what are the things you'd like to improve about this vaccine? Uh, we are in a phase that uh, we got a very important proof of principle. We know this vaccine may work, but a lot of factors need to be improved. And in particular, of course, uh, uh, simplify the protocol Seven boosters is impractical. Imagine to bring this uh, in the center of Africa or in areas that are difficult to reach. It's really hard to implement this. So hopefully you can do with less, more efficient, and also tailor the response to some of the most important weak spots, these targets. We already know that there are some envelopes uh, out there that are more immunogenic than others that induce uh, antibodies more efficiently. This is something that you can verify by looking at uh, the immune response in people who are infected with these strains. Some people develop better antibodies than others. So hopefully we can learn even more and select the right type of envelope to induce the broadest possible responses in the shortest possible time. In translating this to humans, how would you envision the first phase of the clinical trial? Phase one uh, objective will be only safety and immunogenicity. We want to see 
if the vaccine can be injected without any uh, important side effects and if uh, it induces the right immune responses. We are not aiming at uh, very fine protection. And so it will be done probably in healthy young people without uh, a real risk uh, uh, or specific risk for HIV infection. Well, I think we talked a lot about science. Leila, what do you think? If you have any other question? My only question is, what's next for you and your lab, Dr. Lusso? Hmm. Well, and now that we are on this endeavor, I don't think we will leave it soon because, as I was saying, a lot needs to be done. And of course, it's exciting. It's something that if we can dream of, of having a protective vaccine. That would be incredible and would have a tremendous impact on the field and on the next generations, especially in high-risk areas. And I don't think we even need a vaccine that is uh, perfect in order to leave a mark uh, on the pandemic. The good thing is that uh, uh, even a vaccine, it was calculated that would be effective uh, in 50% of the cases, would already have a tremendous impact uh, in the field. We aim at much more. Our vaccine was effective, uh, reduced the risk by 79%, nearly 80%. So even if it's still imperfect, I imagine that uh, the impact uh, in high-risk areas would be tremendous. And of course, we want to make it perfect, <laughs> so we will not uh, give up uh, and accept something imperfect. Wonderful. And last question I would ask, uh, besides hanging out with Dr. Fauci outside of the lab, what do you do for fun? <laughs> the problem with Dr. Fauci is that he never has time to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> That's an unfortunate, <laughs> but understandable. <laughs> I have to say, I don't dislike working in remote. I actually discovered a new dimension of work that I enjoyed a lot, where you essentially dictate the rhythm of your day much more than if you go to an office and then have your day already timed in an official way. The beauty here is that when my brain is on the verge of melting, just grab my bike and go around the neighborhood. My dog is the happiest uh, <laughs> uh, member of the family because he has never seen us so often. And he comes in all my Zoom meetings. He's here under the table right now. Oh, and my God. He's, still, he's starting to learn something about uh, mRNA. <laughs> 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 How cute. I love it. Well, ev evolution will take care of that later. <laughs> evolution should take care of that. I'm a great music lover. And so the pandemic uh, has brought back some music in my life. I'm an amateur uh, player of uh, Baroque flute. Wow. And I found uh, a, a person uh, uh, not so far from my house uh, that who has a harpsichord, which is very rare. Wow. It's not that uh, your typical friend has a harpsichord uh, in their living room. And so we, uh, I took the my flute uh, out of the uh, closet and we started to do some Baroque music together. That is amazing. And is that a common thing among scientists in NIH? Dr. Collins plays music, you play music. Yeah. Who else? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess music, science, uh, uh, mathematics, they say, have something in common. Well, it was such a pleasure having you. Thank you so much for spending so much time with us. We want to let you go and get started with your day. We appreciate how much time you spent chatting with us, and we wish you all the best with uh, these exciting endeavors. Yeah, it was a pleasure to talk to you, Dr. Lossa. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. This episode was written by Chiara Maffe and Ana Paula Lopez, edited by Rukudzo Kanyamba, 
and mastered by Aaron Troutman. The cover art for this episode was created by our creative director, Emma Brand. We would also like to thank the whole team of Science Rehashed, as well as Dr. Rudy Tansy for providing us with the music for our intro. Thank you.